Welcome everyone to yet another edition of OP Noobs Dev Talks. However, this time we're going to throw a little curveball because we're not actually talking to a dev, but we're talking to a member of a publishing team, which is kind of a first for us. Uh, we're talking with Yulia of Tiny Build Games. Yulia, hello. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, guys. Hey. Thank you for inviting me. No, of course, of course. And they have released, or I should say, they have published a number of games, all of which have a positive rating on Steam, which is kind of rare. Speedrunners, Divide by Sheep, uh, Party Hard, No Time to Explain, my personal favorite, and their newest game, Punch Club, which released on January 8th, 2016. Yulia, again, thank you for joining us. So get right into it. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how did you get into uh, gaming as a, a business? Uh, so, well, I've been in gaming all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I never really worked outside of gaming industry. And uh, since uh, I found out about video games, it was my dream to be a part of video games. And I applied to Blizzard when I was 20 years old. Uh, they never hired me, but I still had the dream. And I uh, joined the industry in a roundabout way. Uh, I uh, started organizing a video games conference called Casual Connect. And uh, I was a part of it for seven years, and then I joined Tiny Build. Uh, yes. No. Question. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, I immediately have a question. What What drove you to uh, What drove you to Blizzard? Um, and well, twenty was like um, not last year, right? Of course, last year. Yes. What uh, <laughs> they're fantastic games because uh, I thought that they were like the greatest game producer with Warcraft, Starcraft, Diablo franchises. I always wanted to, uh, to be a part of that, and especially with World of Warcraft. What I applied for was a localization position because this is the only thing that I could do back then is translating from English to Russian and to Russian to English. Ah, so, so you you are yeah. Russian, you like. I am Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Sorry about that. No, uh, uh, no, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> See, this is why we don't let Fred talk a lot of times. That's so why they don't bring me on the show, Yulia. That's why I'm not supposed to be here. Okay, we, I, actually, I, we actually normally bring him to humiliate him. So, on, But you went to school. What was your major in school? How, uh, how, mm -hmm, okay. My, my major was uh, organization management, so I'm kind of doing it right now. Okay. Uh, but I always loved languages and I wanted to uh, work connected with the languages. So uh, I actually started uh, translated games. Like even working in Schedule Connect, I was trying to help developers, especially indie developers. And I often just went ahead and helped them by translating their games into Russian. It was one of my hobbies. And now I, I actually do it as a part of my job at Tiny Build. That so cool. can you walk us through a little bit uh, of lo localization? Because we always hear about games being ported over. We, we always hear about games being translated. What exactly is the process of localization? How how mind some people might call it mind numbing, but it, it actually seems like it'd be more like a, a bit of a detective novel. What would work in this country? What wouldn't work in this country? You know, how how walk us through like a sample of what you would do for localization. So uh, it's basically uh, working with a bunch of uh, XLS sheets, and uh, you not just translate, you make it uh, culturally. Uh, visible for people, you know, who, who would play this game and uh, so, so they can relate to it. So making it so they don't feel it's a translation, so they can tell, oh, uh, somebody from my country made this game uh, when it's not. Yeah, yeah so, most of the time so, you're dealing, I'm, I'm imagining that most of the time you're dealing, one, with being careful not to shock a, speci shock a specific culture uh, from a PR standpoint. And then on the other end, you're probably also adapting uh, your sen the sense of humor, because I, as a Frenchman, oh, definitely. laugh for very different reasons than Steven does as an American. Oh. Probably not. It's true, <laughs> it's true actually. I've, I often feel limited in this country by the things I can say and cannot say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true, but I mean, it's America. It has its own culture, so we have to adhere, right? Anyhow, uh, localization is just uh, like a, a small part, or it's it's not a small. It's actually a big part, but it's just a part of game production, and we take everything complex. Uh, we not just uh, localize 
uh, as a publisher, we are also um, uh, do lots of testing, better testing. We do lots of marketing. We prepare game for the launch. We talk to the platform. We talk uh, to the partners, and uh, we continue supporting game after its release as well. So one last question about localization. I think everybody is pretty familiar with a lot of it. You know, the idea of changing uh, minor things, like for example, in the Final Fantasy games, changing pub to cafe when it gets moved over to the U.S. Little, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, uh, or little, th littler things, or slightly bigger things, because many, for example, Nintendo games get ported over uh, or for the localization team and they change certain terms or mm -hmm. sometimes they change sprites. Uh, mm -hmm. Were there any bits of localization that you kind of looked at and went, oh, why did we do that? Or why did we have to do that? Uh, not so far. That you can talk about, that you actually yeah. can talk about. Because in some cases you might she not want to. can talk about everything. Not a... Yeah, um, you, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, nothing so tremendous that we had to change. And really, uh, what we try to do, uh, we try to crowdsource our localization. So we have a, a bunch of volunteers from Steam forums who go to the spreadsheet and they uh, localize the game. They uh, they are native speakers and they want to help and contribute. So we give them this opportunity. It's actually a great way to localize, especially if you are an indie game developer. Fred, any other questions about localization before we get yeah, into this oh, so-called dry stuff? You started stuff. us on such a dry subject. Oh, I, I haven't even say. begun. To, we have much drier to come, trust me. I, I really wanted to know how the studio came together. That's uh, that's one of the things that I would love to hear the story from somebody who's been inside, who like lives and breathes the culture every day, who knows the people who kind of pursued the dream and made it a reality. So the more you can share about this, I'm sure what is an intimate story, especially considering it's a successful one, uh, we love to hear it. So, uh, so the company was created during a cruise trip. Yes, <laughs> Luke and happen? yes. Go on. So, uh, so uh, CEO of the company, Alex. He was working for many years at Spill Games. He was in charge of marketing for one of the biggest Spill Games portals called A10. Uh, so he knew a ton lot about, about flash games, about web games, about how to do marketing, about ads, all, all kind of sort of things. And he was ready to uh, start his own project. And Luke, <laughs> uh, uh, Luke, his friend, uh, he was organizing Casual Connect for many, many years. And he was ready to start something new. Like he knew industry so very well. And he was ready to start his own new project that is connected to games that would be uh, making games, not just uh, helping people to connect during the event. So they are friends, they're going on a cruise. And uh, for seven days, the brainstorming and Tiny Build was a product of this brainstorming for seven days. After this, like uh, Luke goes back to the United States, starts the company, and uh, it starts functioning as a publisher. So how much so, how much do you know about what actually went on during those seven days? Was there? Was oh, everything. I was there on the cruise. Are you? You were on the <laughs> cruise. So you heard the conversation. Was it? Was it? Oh, was, yes. was there immediately designing this thing to become a, another publishing company, or or immediately was there something to the messaging that said, no, let, let's do something a little bit different here? Uh, so at the time, uh, uh, Alex and Tom, creative director of the company, they already released their first game. No time to explain that you are aware of, uh, that was really thanks uh, to the successful Kickstarter. It's on the bottom right side of the screen, guys, if you can see it on the Twitch. It's on the bottom right side of the screen. Uh, and uh, they completely developed and uh, published this game, and they didn't know what to do. What now? And they thought, hmm, why don't we start pushing games to the market, become a publisher. We, we know so many indie developers and we can connect with them. And uh, we are also indie publisher. We have so many, so many things in common. Why we don't go ahead and help them market their games? So this is how it was born. Very easy because uh, both Luke and Alex had those marketing skills and they knew the industry from inside 
and it was just something natural for them to do. And that's what's crazy to me when I go on your website and even when I listen to your story now, it feels like it was a smooth sailing. Like actually, it's, it's it was sorry, actually I didn't funny. do that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but Take a feel, shot, like, folks. It was it was a good one actually. The, it feels like sure there was, and I think you even you're even daring to say that on the website. You know the the bump at the beginning. Uh, we did this game and there was kind of this moment where we we for for a year or two we didn't really know where it was going but then eventually everything kind of came together at once um it was that okay. does, does i'm they... sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry don't get me wrong it was very scary yeah because no uh, no one knew that what are we doing what is going what it is going to be we were like blind kittens doing this it was just like guessing what's what what is going to be next Sounds like uh, is, is, is 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 it going to be in the apocalypse or is it going to work like we never knew it was it was a gamble and when did, a when, gamble. when did it click when did you guys realize oh shoot this is working uh, i think uh, it, it came with the speedrunner success I think Indie Apocalypse needs to be the name of my next punk cover band. But be <laughs> beyond that part, uh, we we talk to a lot of developers. A lot of people kind of have the same situation where they just all came together. They realized that everybody was really good at their own individual thing. So why not become a cohesive unit? But like I said at the top of this, we don't talk to a lot of publishers. Most people will want to jump into developing because that's the more fun, in some cases, enjo enjoyable thing. Whereas you opted to go for the slightly less exciting and sexy world of business. I disagree. So, <laughs> that's the thing, though. Why? What was it that attracted you fully to the idea of business? Did you ever entertain the idea of, hey, maybe... Maybe I could go into developing instead. Did you uh, ever have that moment? Uh, so what we are doing, we are doing a lot of co-producing, co-development. I cannot say that we don't do any development. We are doing. We also have a develop, uh, development studio in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. where we do lots of development. We uh, do porting uh, to different platforms. Yeah. So we are doing both. So no, I but I do that, you specifically. Uh, oh, me, like, yeah. what, what do you call development? Because development is very broad spectrum. It it's, is. Right, Stephen? It is. It's not it just is. coding, I mean, man. Exactly. I'm, I'm thinking, like, level design or story writing or any of the, do the aspects that don't... That. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing that. Well, no, this is this is true. I mean, did you ever want to, instead of being the, because your official title is business development, which yes, doesn't usually correct. get called, which doesn't usually get lumped in with actual development. So that fine line, you kind of walk in most cases, right? Uh, I'm called this way because uh, I'm good at talking to people. I'm mm -hmm. better at talking to people. I'm better than coding. That's why. So like we are all too. called are the way is that we are the best at. For example, Mike from our team is called the fire starter. <laughs> nice. Because he's great at starting fires. Nice. I know a few guys like that too on the team. Yep. Yeah, if only we had somebody that would put the fires out. Yeah, we don't have that. Uh, another question that I'm very curious to hear is how you guys go about selecting the games you're going to publish. Is um, that uh, what's your selection here? I'm sure because you, you're the type of publishers that uh, y you only release what looks like it goes close to your heart. And I may be completely that's, off here. I mean, that's but true. immediately you express that message. I, I don't even, I, I don't even know much about the studio myself. But I do feel like the mo no, it's I would be, I would be like, which is why about, we brought you here. Which today, is why but. you brought me here. But immediately I went on the site. I started looking at the games you produced, even how you share your story. Im immediately you feel like these are people who actually give a damn. Um, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so, like, how do you guys go about selecting those games? Um, we select games that we enjoy playing ourselves that um, talk to us as an indie developers, as indie publishers. Uh, it's the games that we can play for hours uh, ourselves. It, uh, it's the games that we can talk about to other people and the games that we will not be ashamed of. <laughs> would, you say so, that, would you say that, I have, sorry, Stephen, but would you say that that's unique? Uh, that most pub most publishers don't think that way. I don't know about most publishers. I just know about ourselves, and uh, this, is this is what PR. we do. <laughs> <Good job. laughs> 
Um, uh, so all the games that we have, we just love the developers and we uh, love the games. We love playing those games, and uh, that's we select, that's why we selected them. And also. Uh, our gamers, our fan base love those games. As you can see, they're all funny games. They're like quirky. They all have some kind of weird sense of humor. Sometimes it's darker humor, like in Party Hard, or sometimes it's just uh, like retro humor, like in Punch Club, you know, all, all kind of stuff like that. And But there's always some kind of uh, sense of humor uh, in our games, and this is what we appreciate. It's uh, taking it easy, being humorous, and at the same time, uh, deep and not superficial. So that's, I, I have to admit, going through the catalog, uh, I already mentioned my personal favorite, but man, Divide by Sheep. Oh, yeah. What? In, in my worst fever dream, I could not even <laughs> imagine uh, putting sheep through such a terrible thing, although I am a fan of lamb. The humor <laughs> in many of the games... The humor in many of the games are so off the wall, and I, I wonder, is it, is that kind of the driving force? It I like the fact that you guys sound like you make games, or excuse me, that you publish games that you guys yourselves would play. It's not all about, okay, how do we make the most amount of money with this, which it's okay. still part of it, which we'll get into, but some of the humor, it just seems like it required a very large bottle of whiskey or vodka and then just a couple of hours to decide. <laughs> yeah, Is that basically how a lot of them are picked? <laughs> yes, actually a lot of them are picked uh, during different uh, events mm -hmm. like uh, we, uh, attend uh, uh, and um, uh, exhibit at different events uh, where uh, people are showing us games and uh, we may select our games over there as well, uh, as well as email submissions, uh, as well we also sometimes scout for games online, but uh, there are various ways. About Divide by Ship is interesting game and we <laughs> fell in love with it from the first sight. No, it's actually fantastic. The whole idea about cutting ship in half and then Putting them back together in the raft, isn't it cute? <laughs> and uh, I mean, children love this game as well. <laughs> uh, I would imagine so. <laughs> and when when you guys uh, when you guys look at a game and you're considering publishing it, and even through the development process of the game itself, uh, do you influence at all um, how the game is how the game is developing? Do you have your say? Uh, as as a publisher, and I would I would beg you because I'm I'm sure I'm sure you do know uh, what other publishers are doing. I would beg you to kind of shed some light uh, on yep. what what's the development, what's the approach of a publisher in the indie scene. How much influence um, do they have on the games themselves? So uh, actually, a lot, a lot. Uh, often we have to change a lot in the game to make it publishable, uh, to make it possible. To market, uh, so we have to work uh, with the developer real closely, especially uh, on the last twenty percent of the game uh, so for the that, release. Can that create some friction at times between the developers and the publishers? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, it does. It does create lots of friction. And yeah, because I mean, the developers from the indie scenes are passionate people. They care about their product. Yes, they do. And rightly so. Yes, they do. It's and also why it's the indie scene. That's why uh, the you know business development comes yeah. in, and <laughs> being all nice mean. and uh, <laughs> diplomatic helps. And uh, you try to find a compromise, you know, uh, where you have to be nice to developer, but also tell him, hey, you gotta change this because if you don't, this game is not going to sell. So yes, we have to do this on a daily basis. Well Without without getting too deep into it, because unlike Fred, I'm not trying to get you on the spot and put anybody else on the spot. <laughs> um, I'm not. I've just always been curious about that process because I feel like it's yeah. always kind of in the dark, and we don't really. And even even in the AAA scene, I, I wonder. You know, you talk about Blizzard, and I don't want to yeah. throw this, uh, but this is a big topic in the industry. It's a huge topic in the industry. When Blizzard got bought out by Activision, uh -huh. in many ways, Blizzard has been the massive, the giants of all developers in mm -hmm. the true sense, as as indie developers understand. Mm -hmm. the word developer itself mm -hmm. how much of an influence today blizzard has on uh, activision had excuse me on blizzard is a question that 
most gamers who just like you were, were brought to the PC platform because of Blizzard mm -hmm. are truly starting to ask themselves. So I feel like it's a question that reverberates uh, in all, all angles of the industry and it's one that um, I'm curious to learn about. So yes, I am putting you on the spot a little bit. I apologize, <laughs> Steven, because I really want to know how much you guys influenced the process. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the basic gameplay always stays the same, you know, we, if you pick the game, we pick it because of the gameplay, uh, because we love how it plays itself. So uh, what we influence a lot is uh, parts like testing of the game, parts uh, uh, like um, um, localization, actually lots of it, uh, um, some of the level design uh, and probably um, minor uh, gameplay functions as well. But is there times where you guys actually question um, yourselves? Sorry, like, user interface. We also okay. influence a lot of that. Are there, are there times where, because at the end, it's also an industry that's about innovating. It's about innovation, oh, yeah. right? Definitely, so it's, it's, about, it's about balancing what's safe, what you know the demand wants, and mm -hmm. what the demand doesn't know they want. Right, I, I forget. Once we talked to a developer who was who he gave a great quote. He essentially said, "The uh, the the consumer base, the gamers, they don't know what they want until they get it." Yep, um, it's true. And Completely that's what true. creates the Minecraft phenomenon in, in many ways is an expression of that. We mm -hmm. had a we had an indie roundtable just a couple months ago where mm -hmm. we brought a lot of developers around us and we asked the question, um, would anyone have ever funded, would, would any big studio have ever funded Minecraft? And there was a common consensus. There was a consensus around the table, a hard consensus, and that was a hard no. So do do you guys uh, do you guys as publishers sometimes second guess yourself when you see a developer come some we come come up with something awkward? Do you, do you have this moment of hesitation where you go like, I want to say no, but should we let him fly with this? Much like sometimes. bisecting cheap. I mean, sometimes, yeah. I mean, we always have brainstorming discussion and uh, we're talking, oh, should we have this type of storyline in this game? Oh, should we add this? Should we do this? Of course, it's uh, always ongoing discussion and always an ongoing dialogue with the developer. And, uh, you know, in the dialogue, uh, you can find the truth. This is how it works. And so, Fred, that quote, I think, I think, if my memory serves, was a way back when, when we interviewed Chris Rubio, uh, formerly yes, of Signal yeah, Studios. It was, it was Chris Rubio, he's the creative mind behind uh, uh, Command and Conquer, and he's the one yeah. who, who said that. Uh, so, my, my question to interrupt Fred for a second you. is, it actually <laughs> builds off your question, so you sit tight. As long uh, as you stay on track, because I have another question. Maybe. Uh, so the, to follow up with that, like he said, there are some times that you have to do the balance between is it marketable and is it fun? Yeah. Have there ever been situations where you have just looked at something without naming names, obviously? Have, has there ever been a situation in a game that's been presented where you just looked at it and you're like, this is really fun, but no way can this stay in the game or no way can we actually sell this? Nah. We can always yeah. sell something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's another quote, definitely. So every, so there's never been a situation where you looked at something and went, "That's just too far," or that just oh, that's like, out uh, there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For example, uh, like a naked bot uh, with a rainbow out of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's we had in Japan, we have though. That, we have that in the game, so. <laughs> I want to I wanna ask another question that's also an extension to that, Yulia. And um, yep. I'm, I'm going to pick one of our personal stories to kind of walk you through it and take you there. Um, every week, the, t the team comes together on Twitch and we look at all the trailers of all the PC games coming out for the week and we basically go and discriminate stuff just based on a trailer. We say if this is something awesome. we're interested in, this is something we want to boot, this is drinking, there's fun, we don't we this one we let loose. It's when we stop working and we just come together to have fun. But then we stopped at the end of the year, we stopped this show to kind of look at all the games that are coming out in 2016. And obviously because there's, uh, we were going to focus on the big ones at first, we looked at 150 traders of all the biggest games of all of 2016. So most of them big production, you're looking at multi-million dollar projects and all mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And by the end of this uh, three part show, so it took the whole three weeks to analyze the thing, I was bored. Oh, I, and I'm a AAA fan type of guy, like I play my 
AAA games, I enjoy them and stuff. But I came out of that those, those three weeks of a session thinking I am not being stimulated, stipulated here. Like, <laughs> creatively. And then we came, we went back to our weekly show of, and we watched everything. Like the one man show on the RPG maker. We literally look at everything. And I came out realizing, thank God for the indie scene. And I'm not even a big fan myself of indie games, frankly. But thank God for the indie scene to bring all this creativity. And I, f I feel like very much actually the big AAA games, I would argue, even though I don't play the indie games, are very, very much benefit and are the product of all the creativity that gets funneled through the indie scene. Would you say that that's that's correct? And, and would you say that the publishers are very much at the heart of this phenomenon? By giving yes. the creative flexibility to your guys, I think I think uh, it is. You're right, and um, there are so many people right now that can make games as that are making games uh, thanks to the affordability of uh, gaming in engines. That uh, right now we see the burst of indie game development, and people come up with such crazy ideas, with such original ideas. It's ridiculous that it's blowing up the minds of triple A developers are like, oh my gosh, how we didn't think about this before. They come up with new types of gameplays. They come up with new uh, types of how market your game. And this is super dynamic uh, environment. It's super changing environment. And if you want to survive in this environment, you have to be super flexible. You have to be super scalable team. If you don't, it's going to be hard. So yeah, uh, this we are living in fantastic times. We get to experience all of this cre creativity of the indie games that are coming at us. It's fantastic. I'm excited about this. Also, I think they're great because it doesn't take much time to get into an indie game, uh, to complete an indie game. And How much it, money? And not much money. Yes, it's true. It's a, a small budget and uh, cheaper games as well. That's why uh, they're more affordable for bigger masses. So therefore bigger audiences. That's why they're more popular uh, in developing countries as well. So it's they, for some reason, suddenly they have a bigger reach right now. So that being said, in regards to budgets and whatnot, a lot of people or a lot of devs that we talk to tend to go to Kickstarter. But in the most recent years, we've been seeing a lot more people using Kickstarter, not so much to get funding, but to get eyeballs, to get that visual out there. Almost like it's a Steam green light, which we'll get into in a second. Almost like green light with a dollar sign attached to it. What As... As far as I know, uh, how much does Kickstarter traction mean if you're looking into possibly publishing a game? So, okay, uh, what is Kickstarter? Kickstarter works well if you know how to market your game. Hmm. If you know how to market your game, if you know how to reach out, if you know how to tell everybody in the world about your Kickstarter, yes, go ahead, do Kickstarter. If you don't know these things, if you're only good at developing your game, don't do Kickstarter. That's pretty easy because you will put so much effort in it um, and probably the chances that it will get noticed are close to zero. And we've seen ourselves, we've seen some great projects, some very promising projects never come to ne never come to see the light of day because they went the, the Kickstarter route and the developers were terrific artists, yeah. but they had no sense of business. So That's true. It's a, it's a, it's a very sad. What's the, what's the impact of Kickstarter on, on publishers? One, and what's the impact of Kickstarters on developers from a creative standpoint? Um, well, we are actually here talking to you right now. We are alive and well, thanks to a Kickstarter. Cause no time to explain. Original game was kickstarted and it was a successful kickstarter and it was backed by notch and notch tweeted about it and this is how we became that's alive awesome. that's awesome yes. by the way Talk about yes. minecraft it was back in 2011 right? Kickstarter was not so popular and wasn't so popular for the indie game funding, especially. So it was something different that we made. In fact, uh, uh, back then it was a record for an indie game Kickstarter, $27,000. Oh, so much money. And those money allowed us to survive until the point that we became uh, an indie publisher and we started speedrunners and uh, we started actually doing other games. So it was... a uh, Real Kickstarter for us, literally. 
And that's one of the, the things about Kickstarter that I found interesting is that we've seen a lot of devs, like Fred was saying, we've seen a lot of devs that go to Kickstarter, they get maybe 20 bucks, and that's about it, even though it's an absolutely fantastic game. Meanwhile, we see some other games uh, that make millions on Kickstarter, and then they either underperform, they overpromise, or they flat out just never show up. Yep. So... It's it's one of those things where oh, I tend to think that people forget that Kickstarter is not a pre-order service. Kickstarter is effectively a marketing tool, uh, or at least that's my thought of it. And obviously, it's been successful because, again, you went to Kickstarter, it was successful, it hit a record, and here you are off and running. Yeah. What do you, what do you have to say to the devs that have tried Kickstarter, failed miserably, but still still might have a good idea? but they might be slightly disillusioned on the whole thing. Well, um, I mean, uh, my my advice to such uh, developers is focus on what they can do best, which is developing games mm -hmm. and probably not marketing them. And uh, hopefully they, they can find maybe a partner in the future that can help them in the funding, which is the ultimate goal of the Kickstarter. In the funding, we are Kickstarter or we are just... Uh, money injection and help them uh, to get uh, their game out there so this is my suggestion just uh, to think about what they can do the best Fred, and you look like you want to say something yeah you look like you're desperate to say something. Well, I I wanna I, I don't want to steer also I also don't want to steer away too much from uh, tiny build games and uh, mm -hmm. kind of but these were questions we we're so eager to ask. We thank you, Yulia, for like taking the time to answer them on behalf of the industry. Um, but go, <laughs> going back onto tiny build games, um, how do you guys perceive your growth? Uh, what's I don't I, I don't want to say I don't want to make it so corn it's so tacky and say what's next for tiny build games, um, but. How do you guys, yeah, how, what's the next five years? Let's be ambitious. Oh gosh, five years. I can yeah. tell you what's in, in the next year. No, I want to know next five years. <laughs> I want to know bigger uh, <laughs> stuff be um, released. And... So I guess uh, we release uh, a couple super successful titles this year. So we become a bigger company in the financial sense. So we will be able uh, to invest into bigger games. Uh, into uh, games that are uh, closer to the triple A games, and we will be able to produce some super big hits, and everybody in the world will be playing our games. Is there and, a game? In, is, yeah. there, is there a specific, maybe not a game, but maybe a genre that you guys are eager to, get, to take a crack at that might that might be a, a departure of some sort from the type of games you've you've played in the past, or you've developed in the past. Uh, I mean, uh, we're excited to start publishing games uh, that uh, made uh, with Unreal Engine, which we publish uh, the first game uh, made with Unreal Engine this year. Yeah, they look better and better. Yeah. Hey, now so, there's something to be said for the pixel games there, Fred. It, it doesn't yes. all have to look photorealistic. No, okay, what about pixel games? What do you have to say about pixel games? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so speaking <laughs> of pixel games, <laughs> since... Since I, I think you guys just recently released a game, so tell us a little bit about Punch Club. How did that come about? It's a it's a boxing RPG, which is uh, probably the best thing I've ever said. Yes, it's a boxing simulator, um, a boxing tycoon, and uh, it's made by a small uh, development team in Russia. And uh, uh, Alex met uh, this Lazy Bear, which is the name of the studio. Um, in Russia uh, during uh, the one of the conferences and uh, he looked at the game and he said wow that's awesome and it, back then it was um, even differently named it was completely different from uh, what you're seeing right now um, but uh, he was able to see the future of it I guess <laughs> So uh, I can see that there are some questions in in the chat. There are some people uh, watching. Uh, I guess we should not. Yeah, there's that, they've they've yes. just been talking about memes the whole time and how dank oh, okay. they are. So we're we're not missing a whole lot. But okay, uh, I'm just making sure that people are not asking questions and yes. uh, the questions. Uh, She's actually respecting the Twitch process, Stephen. Oh, we don't have to respect them. Like I said, they're just being super dank in there. I, I don't I don't know if we can really even go in there right now. I don't think it's safe. So okay. with with Punch Club, 
it it just it's it's one of those weird games that you would never honestly think of and yet when you watch the trailer and you read about it you're like oh my god this is probably the best thing i never knew i wanted uh and a lot of the a lot of the games all tend to have the same price point do you feel as on the business perspective obviously it's important but how important is it what criteria do you look for as a business to decide on a price point for a game Um, because some people will complain about two dollars some people complain about ten dollars we see people complaining all the time what is the criteria apparently also mm -hmm. last week you were sick sick with pax box yeah that's correct Uh, just sorry to disrupt That is correct. Uh, Anyhow, well, we were talking about Punch Club, now we are talking about the price and how pricing is different for different games. Is this correct? Well, um, uh, I mean, a lot of pricing comes from uh, how many gameplay hours this game is going to give you. Mm -hmm. Uh, So basically the value uh, of the uh, fun time. I don't know if I can agree to that. I don't know if I can agree with that. So okay. It's a, ma- it's a matter of plenty. I, I was going to get him to yeah, wake up. Yeah, I have to kind of object. Um, I object. I don't know if that's really because uh, my my uh, my personal stake is my my personal position is that actually gamers no longer want quantity. They want quality. I feel like ten years ago we wanted quantity. Qu- t- ten years ago we wanted to go sixty hours, sixty hours, sixty hours, and now the industry is moving at such a fast pace. And actually, in, in connecting it to all the great stuff that's also coming out of the indie scene, we're kind of want a, a cheaper, a, a cheaper experience, a better experience, a shorter experience. Uh, so as a it, gamer, it, it, I think I represent a lot of people saying that. He'll keep doing okay. Thing. Well, okay. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, you have never brought me on board. Gosh, this is the 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 pricing question is always very kind of hard and pain, painful question. We, to be honest, we have always have to kind of guess because if you make the price too high, there will be less people who will buy the game. If you make the price too cheap, there will be a ton of people, but then you will get less money. So you have to find this sweet spot. For the pricing it's like basic economics that i'm talking about and it works for games as well so we experiment a lot with pricing and uh right now it's basically on our uh, depends on our experience with games uh we put this price on the game we put this price on the game and if somebody thinks this game is too expensive well i say well Wait uh, for the sale. job. <laughs> wait for the sale. Yeah, we, exactly, we exactly. Sale, wait for the sale. Not wait for the uh, go get a job is not is got not good PR messaging. Oh. And I stop because I actually see those people in the channel that are telling me that people want different things and that I'm arguing with a publisher rep when I shouldn't be doing it. That was me. I mean, uh, that was <laughs> really great. Well, you I mean, never tell people go get a job. <laughs> yeah, I know that's uh, I'm I'm a terrible PR person. You, you I should not be. This is entirely yeah. true. So, I mean, obviously there are some times that games have come across the, the table that are either woefully overpriced, like maybe you get an hour, hour and a half, and it's priced at, I don't know, $40, $50. That is kind of a thing in some cases. Uh, it happens in AAA. It hap- happens in indie. Uh, again... Since I tried to, I want to say a lot of that pricing actually uh, comes uh, from the budget that people put into the development. Yeah. So if there is a huge team and they put a couple of years of development and they probably put a multi-million budget in the game, of course they want uh, their money back and as fast as possible. Otherwise, they will go bankrupt. And that's why it's so hard. Uh, uh, it's so hard to find this perfect price point because they think, oh, this is good. And it doesn't sell at this price point and they get even less money than they were hoping to get. It's it's really a huge dilemma and I don't do not have an answer for this for you. Um, because Fred. we question ourselves was it good price? Always. It's always it's, it's a, a very interesting question, but I'm I am going to acknowledge the chat as uh, there's somebody I was about to read yeah, that somebody one. who asked uh, Sasia. Is, well, why don't you read oh, it? Oh Sasia, hello I, Sasia, I remember you too. So, I think I was going to. I was just going to say, Fred, I'm going to interrupt you because this is more important. Yeah, and so people Sasia, can actually understand the question. That's right. In the, exactly. In the chat, uh, he and or she asks, I'm interested in how business side of Tiny Build 
connects with the games itself that are developed within the company. Uh, is it goal-oriented or just something that's geared toward the current interests of the players? And then Crazy Zombie slunk off to a corner somewhere. Um, uh, so all of us have a lot of experience in games industry, so we kind of know what we want from a game. And especially Alex, who is so often a producer of all of the games that uh, we publish. So Alex pretty much knows what he wants to see in the game and he works uh, with the developer on this ultimate goal. I hope this answers the question. If not, I'm happy to clarify. Fred, any thoughts? God, yeah, apparently all the viewers are more important than Fred, so I'm not getting a lot of love in the chat. Oh, that is entirely so, true. I uh, actually have a good question for you, Yulai, if you don't mind. Yeah. How does the company as a whole think of early access and, and do you encourage mm -hmm. your developers to get into that or do you actually told them, tell them, no, 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 just give, deliver a polished product. That's always better. Uh, I mean, it really depends on the game. Uh, for some games, early access is good. Uh, it works fantastic uh, for our game speedrunners. Um, and we also have uh, another game, Void, that is uh, in early access. And uh, uh, it works well uh, for games that are multiplayer. So if you want to get some audience for your game before the actual launch, uh, if it needs players to interact with each other, it's good to release in the early access. If yeah. uh, the, if connect, it's a, the connection, yeah. between, especially, I think that's especially relevant in the PC industry. The connection between the gamers and the developers is like no other platform around. Uh, we we know so because we deal with both sides, and sometimes we even work with both sides, and we see the influence that the community has on the developers and the special relationship, the special bond that they share, especially on anything, anything that's played competitively, anything that's mm -hmm. played on, online. It's amazing um, to what extent developers can actually subject themselves to the will of their community, no, no mar matter how small they might be. So that's how, true. Well, how as, as a direct of business development when you see this happening how, what is your is your key message hey the community is great but do what you want and the community is not always right or or is your message more among the lines of yes go for the community the community knows better so uh, we work a lot a lot with the community and community matters for us. We listen very closely because sometimes the greatest ideas are coming from the community side of things. Community finds a box in your game, community tells what they want, and we don't get, make games for ourselves, we make games for people. So we need to know what people want. It's very important to communicate to on a daily basis with people and not to lose touch with reality. It's like a reality check talking to people they tell you oh this is good this is bad and you're like oh i see now right <laughs> so exactly. speaking of reality checks and the community uh, how painful is it from a pr standpoint to see some of the interesting interactions that some developers have in the say the steam community forums with some of their more vocal critics um is, is it is it really painful, like you're on fire, or is it one of those things where you just go, hmm, that's somebody that let their ego get the best of them? Well, you know, you talk to such people uh, on a daily basis, and at some point, uh, you just stop, you know, reacting so painfully uh, to the harsh criticism. You just think of the ways how you can improve, how you can do better, and no, uh, fo not focus on your minuses, but rather focus on your improvement. We actually have a developer probably uh, connected to you and the studio, Yulia. Um, Steven, you, you may want to read out this out loud because they, yeah. won't, they won't understand me. This is oh, Stuff Castle? Being yeah, on Stuff, early access. Yeah, Stuff Castle. That would be oh. the fella. So being on early access, I love having a community behind my game. It's great having people give feedback and give bug reports and things like that. Also with the daily dev streams, I do having them be able to come into the chat and give me direct feedback is amazing. So okay. it's not so much a it's question. A, it's not a question. Right? He just That's a statement. Yeah, but so yeah. It, it leads to a question, though, because what happens when you get the opposite result? And it ha we see it a lot. And it has a, it has a very, very negative effect on artists. 
And how could it not? When you're when you're spending hours, you're spending your entire life bunch. Sometimes it's just one guy. Sometimes it's two, three guys. They're in their home. They're building the game that they wanted to build, and then they launch it on early access, and it's just. I, 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 either negative or, or just mixed or and the community is just bashing because the community come on let's cut the crap here for a second the community is not always the kind loving and gentle um we're gonna help the developer team that we're making it out to be right now the community well, can be extremely harsh that's true well maybe then you think maybe this is not what the community needs right now think how you can improve think how you can improve their reviews uh, how you can make the game better? What people do not like about your game? Make it better. Hey, don't be lazy. By the way, uh, uh, the <laughs> comment uh, is actually from uh, the artist on one of our games, uh, uh, Fearless Fantasy. Nice. And he just released his game in the early uh, access, and I really recommend checking it. Well, congratulations. Well, we also have a zombie asking a question now that I've found Oh, yes, I, I, I know, it's Devin. <laughs> uh, so, Crazy Zombie, uh, most companies don't really connect with their fans unless they're famous, sometimes even indie, and we actually have seen that too firsthand. Uh, if you ever ever get as big as, say, Bethesda or something, hopefully not as buggy, uh, would you still attempt and connect with the users as often as now? And would you make prettier games? So, uh, talking about big and uh, getting as big as... Uh, so, that would mean that we would have to hire lots of people and mm -hmm. work with a lot of people as a corporation. Gosh, we're really scared of being anything like that. It's so big and scary. And uh, and we, we actually enjoy being an indie publisher and probably being small, what, it, what connects us with the uh, indies. And that's why we can work with them so well. If in corporation, it beca becomes impersonal. Um, uh, and but you this guys is what the, we'll I mean, try to do. <laughs> yes, you guys have... You guys have had some not to not to toot your horn, but you've had m big successes. You're gaining a lot of steam, um, for lack of a better word. A lot of steam. In smooth sailing, <laughs> you like you just go on your social media and you can tell that people are loving what you do. There are a, a lot of fans behind you who support you, so you do have the potential to grow. Are you actually is is the leadership of the the, the, the company slowing down growth and saying let's be careful? We want to remain true to our core and and not go go big or you can grow as a company uh, but you can stay small as a team interesting yeah so it's called it's called proper scaling <laughs> <laughs> Which send, is me, something... send me an email about that after <laughs> Yes, proper mind. scaling. Uh, it's uh, about not uh, uh, having your burn at crazy rates and not, uh, you know, firing tons of people when you cannot actually cover monthly expenses. Because such months happen when you're an indie developer and indie publisher. That's why it's very important to keep uh, your team small. But I am saying, even if you grow twice the size as we are right now, we'll try to keep in touch with all of our fans and all the press, Twitch streamers, YouTubers, because uh, this is what's, what is driving us. This is our driving force. It's what is important to us. So we'll try never to lose this grip. I think I've always kind of gotten a kick out of the fact that historically and stereotypically, gamers are usually painted as antisocial, uh, insular people. And we always hear about the horror stories of development or the horror stories of publishing a game where teams, they butt heads, they just can't get past their own personal issues and then <laughs> we hear about teams just exploding or just flat out imploding so what what kind of of issues has how, how do you address those kinds of things because that becomes more of a less of a morale issue and more of a personnel or an, uh, a human resources issue so what what steps are there to actually deal with that in a small indie uh company or even in a larger company um to be honest with don't really understand the issue. Mm. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, for for example, there are I've there have been instances where you've got a developer and they have some infighting, and one person leaves the team. Uh, what? Let me kind of rephrase it. So, say a game is in development, you've been working with the developers, mm -hmm. and then suddenly a major cornerstone of that team That's leaves. True. At what point? 
is there anything that can be done? What what can the publisher do to kind of help? Because there's there's kind of the stigma as a publisher. They send you down. Yeah. Some some I, indie devs are against publishers. Some of them want to be totally independent. I mean, what what good can come of that type of situation? So, for example, if you are working already uh, on a game, if you already signed the game to publish it, and suddenly there is some something happens inside of the development team, uh, like a person leaves and the another person cannot continue working on the game. What we try to find help to help finish the game. Um, actually, this is what happened on one of our games. We needed to find uh, an artist to finish the game. So we did, and we finished the game, and uh, yeah, we, we just- Can you say what game it was, out of curiosity? Yes, yes, uh, it was Peerless Fantasy. Oh, okay. Yes, the artist had to leave, so we had to find a different artist. Yeah. And so it's not it's not always a, a team explosion. Sometimes people suddenly grab a, a, a day job. Sometimes they have health issues. Yes. It, it's not always, hey, I'm going to punch the lead developer right now. No, so, it's, no. yes, people just select a different paths in life and we are understanding about such things and we just do what needs to be done and uh, try to reach our goals. I can tell uh, Yulia sent uh, some people from her channel to our Twitch because there's some really educated comments in our chat. It's a pleasure to see. Uh, Are you trying to say no, that our audience I'm is not, not saying, educated, Fred? Right? I'm not saying, but I see. I still see the, the, the typical Fred bashing that <laughs> is one oh. to expect <laughs> from the chat, but we also have some developers commenting on the, on the game process as a whole, so that's great. Hey, Yulia, uh, Stephen, we don't want to take too much of Yulia. So no, we, um, we Okay, I can see that. Well, I know... Uh, most of people in the chat actually so yeah so uh, your people yes uh, all my friends <laughs> I see it. That's I see awesome. There. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for doing this for the for us, uh, Yulia. Uh, we're super excited, obviously, to have gotten the chance to talk to you. And uh, I don't know how much time do we have, uh, or you, are you are we wrapping up? Or uh, uh, I think we're just about wrapping up. I think Fred's getting tired, and I think we've pelted you with enough questions. So that being said, since everybody in the chat is already your friend, but since we still have to keep some decorum, uh, Punch Club did just recently release. It is $9.99 on Steam right now. I love the soundtrack, honestly. I think more indie games need to have their, their soundtrack plus the art book attached. I totally jump on those as soon as they're available. Um, I, I don't know why more don't. I mean, there's such wonderful artwork and such wonderful music, such talented people that are out there that now have a platform where in past decades, maybe they wouldn't get that opportunity. And so it's just one of those things where I'm so happy to see that technology is being used for something good uh, as opposed to anything else. But that being said, any final thoughts that you want to say to everybody in the chat? Even well, yes. You might <laughs> Actually, I just noticed that it says that it's coming this fall. The game is out. Go grab it on Steam right now. It's yes. out on iOS. It's out on Android devices. So go grab it. We are currently porting it on consoles. The game is fantastic. We had a fantastic launch for this game where we had a Twitch play, uh, players were playing and completed the game in three days. So it, it's a great game to experience. So everybody should go and buy it right now. Steven, <laughs> uh, why, why can't you do this for us every time you close the show, Steven? Because the long and short of it, Fred, is that I have you screaming in my ear, we're going over time, we're going over time. <laughs> I'm a stickler to, to schedules. Uh, <laughs> having said this, we do publish the interview uh, on, on, our, uh, tweet, on our YouTube channel and on iTunes, and we get a lot of traction there. At least some, we get a lot of traction on the website, Julia, so uh, do not despair. Thank you for doing this for us. Very much, uh, very much appreciate it. It was a lot of pleasure and thank you guys for having me and bye-bye. Everybody follow Tiny Build at Tiny Build. Yes. Bye-bye, guys. Right. Thanks, Bye. Steven. Thank you, guys. <laughs>